Welcome to Da Vinci Academy's Chapter 4 section on the abdomen, or Lecture 4 on the inguinal canal and associated hernias. So the inguinal canal is a very important abdominal structure. It is present in both male and females and is a common site for herniation of abdominal contents. The canal is especially important in men for scrotal development and the proper descent of the male testicle. During male fetal development, the testicle will actually arise in the abdominal cavity. It will then descend inferiorly into the scrotum via the inguinal canal. A structure called the processus vaginalis is an outpouching of the peritoneum that attaches to the gubernaculum and is pulled in a unidirectional manner into the scrotum. If the testicle for some reason gets caught in the inguinal canal, which is called cryptorchidism, the testicle may actually become non-functional and even predispose the individual to two testicular cancer, such as seminomas. Once the testicle drops into the scrotum, the processus vaginalis is actually supposed to close and obliterate. But what happens when the processus vaginalis fails to do so and remains patent, the individual will actually be predisposed to hernias. In women, who of course do not have testicles, the inguinal canal contains another structure called the round ligament. The round ligament attaches to the lateral aspect of the uterus, it courses through the inguinal canal, and actually terminates into the fascia of the mons pubis. So now we'll go ahead and discuss the anatomy of the inguinal canal. So the anatomy of the inguinal canal is very unique and is composed of the four anterior abdominal wall muscles, their aponeuroses, as well as the transversalis fascia. The walls of the inguinal canal are often visualized being a rectangular prism or sometimes even a cylindrical prism with rings on both ends of it, being the superficial and the deep inguinal rings. The wall components of the inguinal canal may vary depending on what resource you use and what location you are in the canal. Before we go ahead and discuss the fine details of the canal, let's first discuss some of the ligaments and tendons. The first one is the inguinal ligament, which is also called the pupars ligament. And this is a structure that attaches from the acis to the pubic tubercle. And this is what creates the inferior border of the inguinal canal. It is composed of the external oblique aponeurosis and is continuous with the fascia lata of the thigh. Another structure that's important to note is what's called the conjoint tendon. It's actually a fascial fusion of the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis aponeurosis. It's located right here on the medial portion of the inguinal canal and the posterior portion. And it helps make up the roof of the inguinal canal. The next structure to talk about is the lacunar ligament. The lacunar ligament, as you can see right here, kind of shaped like lunar, like a crescent moon, is located in the medial portion of the inguinal canal and connects the inguinal ligament and the Cooper's ligament. Speaking of the Cooper's ligament, which is also called the pectineal ligament, is located right here on the bone itself. It runs on the posterior border of the femoral ring and it inserts onto the pectineal line. This structure is very important to note, especially during surgery, because it's very strong and durable. So surgeons will often suture into the ligament of Cooper to help stabilize the hernia repair. So as we mentioned about the rings itself, there is the deep inguinal ring and the superficial inguinal ring. The deep inguinal ring is located halfway between the acis and the pubic tubercle. So this is not drawn to scale, but we'll imagine this right here being halfway in between. This right here is the deep inguinal ring. Then this right here is the superficial inguinal ring. And this is the site where the testicle actually will exit the inguinal canal and enter into the scrotum. So the testicle will actually come through here, travel inside the canal, and then come out like this. So the walls itself. So the walls of the inguinal canal may again vary depending on what resource you use, but for our purposes we'll kind of boil it down to this. The anterior wall is composed of the external oblique aponeurosis. The posterior wall is composed of the transversalis fascia. The roof is composed of the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis, like we mentioned with the conjoined tendon. And the floor of it is the inguinal ligament, which is again the external oblique. So again, superficial, deep, this is our canal. Tesla comes in, goes through here, and comes out this way. So as you can see from this image, again, testicle comes in through the deep, goes through the canal, out the superficial, and into the scrotum. So in discussing the anatomy of the inguinal canal, it's very important to discuss what the Hesselbeck triangle is. The Hesselbeck triangle is a common site identified in order to classify inguinal hernias. 
as either a direct inguinal hernia or an indirect inguinal hernia. The walls of the, inguinal, the, walls of the Hesselbeck triangle are composed of the medial border being the lateral border of the rectus abdominis, the lateral border is the inferior epigastric vessels, and the inferior border is the inguinal ligament itself. <coughs> so as you can see, this is the inguinal ligament, this is your medial border, your lateral border. Your medial border is actually going to be your rectus abdominis muscles. So imagine this is where your six pack is like this. This is your lateral border of the rectus, but your medial border of the triangle. And this is your lateral border, and this is your inferior epigastric vessels. And why is this important? Again, this is how you will classify a direct or indirect inguinal hernia. So what's also important to note, especially with dealing with the inguinal canal, is how the fascia will transition into the scrotum itself and the testicle. So the fascial transition is probably one of the most important things you need to know, especially with dealing with a spermatic cord. The external oblique becomes the external spermatic fascia. The internal oblique becomes the cremasteric fascia, and the transversalis fascia becomes internal spermatic fascia. And this is a great mnemonic, ice tie. So again, I internal oblique. So I for internal spermatic fascia goes with transversalis fascia, cremasteric fascia goes with internal oblique, and the externals go together. In talking about the spermatic cord itself, it's important to know the contents of the spermatic cord. There's the whole concept of the threes in terms of the spermatic contents, which is helpful to know. With the spermatic cord, you have three nerves. You have your autonomics, you have your genital branch of the general femoral nerve, and you have your ilioinguinal nerve, which does not actually go in the spermatic cord. It just goes through the inguinal canal itself and runs on top of the spermatic cord. Then you have three arteries. You have your cremasteric artery, your testicular artery, and your artery to the vas deferens. Then you have three fascial layers, like we mentioned before with your ice tie. You have your external spermatic fascia, your cremasteric fascia, and your internal spermatic fascia. So again, don't forget, ice tie. Then you have three plus one other structures. You have your vas deferens, you have your cremasteric muscles, your pampiniform plexus, which is just your venous plexus that helps with temperature regulation of the spermatic cord. And then you have your associated lymphatics as well that are important to note. So now we're gonna go ahead and start discussing hernias. So hernias occur when the overlying structure has been compromised and allows for the deep contents to protrude through this defect. So theoretically, you could have a hernia pretty much anywhere on the body. It just happens to be in areas that have chronic weakness in the walls. So hernias are again commonly located in the abdomen and the upper region of the leg, where abdominal contents are capable of protruding through the overlying abdominal wall. But again, they can theoretically occur anywhere in which there is a weakening in the wall Sites of weakness predispose hernias to the intestines and can arise due to many different factors from stress to congenital defects to iatrogenic effects caused by surgical access sites. So when we discussed the Hesselbeck's triangle, we talked about direct versus indirect inguinal hernias. So it's important to again discuss Hesselbeck's triangle. So direct inguinal hernia occurs when there is a protrusion of the abdominal contents or fatty tissue through the Hesselbeck triangle itself. This happens to occur in elderly men with increased intra-abdominal stress because the wall is actually being what's torn open. The contents are only covered by the peritoneum and the external oblique aponeurosis. And this is very high yield and often tested upon. The contents in a direct inguinal hernia only contain a covering of the peritoneum and the external oblique aponeurosis. So, again, the way I think of it is Delta, delta is a triangle in Greek, D for triangle, so D, Hesselbeck's triangle. Now we're going to talk about the indirect inguinal hernia. This is when you have a protrusion of abdominal contents or fatty tissue through the deep inguinal ring. And this is what happens when people have a failed fusion of the processus vaginalis. So this is most likely to be an infidence, infants with congenital predispositions, and this is what can cause the contents to protrude through the deep ring as well as enter into the inguinal ring, superficial. These, however, these hernia contents are covered by all three layers of the abdominal wall. Like I said before, direct are only covered by the peritoneum and the external oblique. You have another type of hernia called an incisional hernia. That's pretty much whenever you try to make some sort of incision into the body itself, this incision causes weakness in the anterior abdominal wall. 
And it's at this site of weakness, whether it's laparoscopic or exploratory laparotomies, this weakness allows for a potential site of herniation. You have another one called an umbilical herniation right here, in which you actually have a hernia that can protrude through the umbilicus. Umbilical hernias can again be through access sites because of surgery or can also be because of congenital effects. It's also important to note that very young infants and newborns will actually have an umbilical hernia. And unless it's very significant and very large, it oftentimes will actually close upon its own self. Then you have another structure called the femoral hernia. The femoral hernia is what causes, if you imagine this being the kind of the inguinal crease and where your inguinal canal is it's down over in this area <coughs> where your femoral canal is located. This most likely occurs medial to the femoral vessels. These hernias more commonly occur in females and are higher risk for organ strangulation than the inguinal hernias. In this instance, a femoral hernia in men will most likely often herniate small intestines. However, femoral hernia in women will often more likely herniate the ovaries. And as you can see right here, this is where you have your inguinal ligament, and then medial to this in this area is where you would have your either ovaries or small intestines herniation. So now we're going to go ahead and discuss some clinical pearls. So treatment for inguinal hernias is often done via either a laparoscopic or open technique. The opening technique has become more and more abandoned due to the difficulty in controlling inguinal hernia postoperative pain syndrome in which that, that nerve we had discussed before, that ilioinguinal nerve is somehow either compressed or injured. It has increased recovery time and also has an increased rate of infections. Inguinal hernias require reparation of the abdominal defects and often require a high ligation of the closure of the processus vaginalis. So the difference between an indirect and direct repair is that in an indirect with the infants and an open patent vaginalis, you have to close this patent vaginalis. In individuals that have a direct inguinal hernia repair, there is no, there is no problem with the processus vaginalis. You just have to close the, that stress-induced abdominal defect. So as we discussed before, the inguinal nerve runs on the spermatic cord in the inguinal canal. It goes to its cutaneous site. It does not enter the spermatic cord, and it does not ent exit through the superficial ring. However, during hernia repairs, exposure, compression, or transection of the inguinal nerve can happen and can result in significant postoperative pain. Sometimes many individuals even consider this pain to be worse than the chronically recurring inguinal hernias themselves. So now we'll discuss incarceration versus strangulation. So if you imagine this is your anterior abdominal wall, right, like this, and you have your abdominal contents under here, this is normal. There's no problem with any contents protruding through this wall. But say you have a defect, whether it's from surgery or congenital or whatever it may be, you have a defect. So now your organs can exit through this defect very easily. What happens is, say the hernia contents are actually able to protrude through. So now you have a little sac forming like this. And this tight, narrow portion right here of the hernia contents can lead to what's called an incarceration. And it's just like someone who's in jail is incarcerated, it's pretty much locked and it's hard to push this back in through this defect. So if you cannot push the hernia contents back through, it's called incarceration. Strangulation is often a result after incarceration in which blood supply to the hernia content ceases and necrosis may actually ensue. So when you suspect strangulation and incarceration, it's very important to do immediate surgical repair in order to save the small intestines and potentially even the individual's life. Thank you very much. And that concludes this section of Da Vinci Academy.